and welcome to Roadmap 2019, our platform where we engage with major stakeholders in Nigeria's journey to the general elections. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. Thanks for joining us. My guest on today's edition of the program says disruption is the name of the game for next year's polls. According to my guest, Nigeria needs to chart a new path for itself to succeed, and that means new ideas and new thinking. Education and tackling youth unemployment, as well as moving large chunks of the populace out of extreme poverty, will be the focus. Now, please join us as we talk to the presidential candidate of the Allied Congress Party of Nigeria, the ACPN, Mrs. Obiageli Ezekwezili. Mrs. Quizili, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to Roadmap 2019. Thank you very much. Now, uh, you've been very busy. <laughs> but I want to start by asking, this decision to join this particular race. Yes. So I've, I've asked a number of those who know you very well. And right. said, it was more like you got angry. <laughs> Is that an apt description? <laughs> I got fed up. I don't know if I took it. You know, I got fed up. I totally got to the place where I said, no, we don't have four years to waste. We don't have four years to go through the same ritual of um, having uh, a political class that has become incorrigible and totally impervious to the challenges of this society. Um, to a political class that uh, actually thinks that we can follow our own pace and that uh, the rest of the world is not moving ahead in such, with such speed that we could hear that report that we overtook India, a country that's seven times our population and the number of extremely poor people on the face of the air and not feel chattered. Now, someone like you, of course, who's, who's, who came back, uh, you, you, first you had a stint in government, or first you were on the international stage, you worked with Professor Jeffrey Sachs, uh, and so on, and then you went into uh, Transparency International, the NEITI, and then you came back, served in government, did the due process thing, mineral resources, and then into education, and then you went back to the World Bank. Uh, this statistic you gave, I mean, coming from outside, I mean, this is not produced by our own statisticians, uh, comes as some sort of, from what you said, disappointment, deep disappointment. But now, when you move into the political arena, some people say there's just that little thing that you lose, especially when you join our own politics. You've joined it now, do you see that? Um, yes, um, the, it's the murky waters of politics that's kept a number of uh, people like you and I out of politics. But we must listen now to Plato. I actually am sad that it took me this long to get to the point where I understood what Plato was saying. Plato said that um, if you think that politics is beneath you, you will be governed by your inferiors. And um, it might sound arrogant, but the truth is, when you look at what has happened in our country, we haven't been playing with a star team in the world of politics. If uh, governing Nigeria were the equivalence of playing in the Premier League or the Championship, um, we haven't played with a cast of um, players that could give us development. And um, when I first heard a thing like that from Lee Kuan Yew, a former Prime Minister of Singapore. Uh, of Singapore, I really didn't take it to heart um, as being about politics. I felt that if we had the right kinds of people that would run government, as in 
technicians, technical people that would run government, that the country would always be finally okay. But the more the years have gone, the more I have seen that the politics undermines everything. That you can have the best of things that enable you get back on a path of growth, get back on a path of building necessary institutions of development, but that the politics, while variable, can undermine everything in a stroke of a pen. And I do recall that when I was in government, at the time that I first returned and I was doing the due process, there were some of the politicians that sniggered and said, let her be saving that money. By the time we do what we will do to it, after they are gone, she will know she came home to waste her time. I, I didn't take that as, I thought it was just try talk. But, you know, <laughs> these days when I meet people who knew what we did with due process, who then come up to me, maybe at the airport or where at events and say, oh, Madam, due process, due process is no longer what it used to be. That's, that's a statement that validates that kind of threat that the political class was making. The political class did not see a number of the reforms that we did as, um, as interesting for them personally. I recall a certain deputy speaker of the House of Reps saying to me one morning, he came to the villa and as we got talking, suddenly he said to me, he said, you know, Madam Due Process, all these reforms you people are doing, they are good, they are good, but why now? Hmm. Why now? Yes. He said, because it is biting us. He said, you know, one of the ones that he hated was the due process. He said, you people don't know that we have constituencies that depend on us for one thing or the other. Everywhere is dry because of this due process. Another one they hated was, um, um, ha what, what was that, monetization, you know? So the reforms were not taken ownership of by the political group can simply be undermined completely. And that's what we've seen. So it is very clear that when people like you and I look at politics and say, no, we can't do this. There is vacuum and a different set of people will play the politics. So we haven't played with the excellent team in our political system. And the result, therefore, is no matter what we try to do on the technical side, the politics will take it down. I think the same Lee Kuo was sensible in the way he approached it. I do recall that I had classmates at uh, the Kennedy School of Government from Singapore. What he always did was that he took his technical people and made them politicians so that there was no gap. gap. That, that vacuum wasn't there. Was there was no vacuum. They were very strong, strong technical skills, but he would, he would put them through the political system so that they were members of the House, they were elected parliamentarians, they had one rule or the other in the political party, so that that way they were all working together toward the building of a nation. So it wasn't surprising that he got the kind of outcome he did because you know, Singapore and Nigeria were <laughs> relatively so close. We had a GDP per capita of about um, $98 at some point in the 60s. They had a GDP at that time of about 200 and something dollars. Okay, take it some 50 years after, and they have a GDP per capita of almost $60,000. We have a GDP per capita of $1,948. You can see the difference. So when he said that 
No country can grow beyond the quality of its leaders. I understood it not to mean the politicians, Politics, yes. but a leadership, really. The topmost of it is the political leadership. 